To our visitors, we're glad that you've come our way. This is the time of year which you probably were able to understand from the announcements by Brother Cohn that we're always exceedingly busy. Some of us are very involved in all sorts of ways. For those of us who are involved in putting the lectureship together and especially in putting the book together, it's um, at least a half a year project or more. And so we certainly covet your prayers and hope that this coming Wednesday evening at the beginning at 6.30 for our singing and then the first lecture, uh, there'll be two on Wednesday night. The uh, schedule has been in the bulletin for some time. The first lecture then will start at 7 and we'll be busy then on Thursday and Friday and Saturday until Sunday afternoon with lectures. Hope you'll certainly want to get one of the books. This year... We are dealing with the Lord's church and counterfeit churches. Thus, we shall discuss what the Bible teaches about the church that Jesus built. And we shall also examine churches that he didn't build. Uh, We want you to come with an honest heart and with your Bibles open that you'll be willing to study these particular matters. And we covet your prayers that we can be able to do much good. We've already had really more book orders and some from different people before the whole thing uh, than we have had before. Of course, it will be out on the Internet. It will be archived so you can go back later and look at it also. So we hope that those who may be listening now and watching this worship period over the Internet will try to make your plans, if you've already done so, to, to do that. I've often said, though I haven't lately, that we as the Lord's Church are open and above board. We welcome your investigation of the Lord's Church. We're obligated as members of it to be ready to give an answer to every man that asks us the reason of the hope that's within us with meekness and fear. So we're ready to do our best to give you a thus saith the Lord for what we believe and what we practice and that we are certainly prepared and try to be all the time to defend any component part of the whole system of faith that is the New Testament system, as Jude said in Jude 3, contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Now, I hadn't planned to bring this sermon, but because of the nature of the lectureship and then a little thing that happened this past week, I decided I would kind of come at it in delivering the sermon in a little different way. Now, some of you are on uh, the list where I buy, mail out things. Some of them, all of us, mail to one another on email. And this past week, I think it was Wednesday, may have been Tuesday, I mailed out an inquiry to those on the list asking about the veracity of a couple of things. It had nothing in the world to do with the Bible. Uh, had to do with current events and recent events. And I just wondered if these stories were true. Well, I also have a list that I get through a, you've got to follow this, uh, my second cousin's husband. (laughs) And uh, I sent it out on that list too. And I had some different ones send and tell me what they thought about that particular current event. And then also I I got home Wednesday night and uh, found this. Now, you'll understand, those who get any email I write, whatever the subject, that down at the bottom of it for many months now, and, and you're aware everybody can do this at the bottom of your email, you can have something about yourself. And so I have my academic degrees, and I have an address. I have Evangelist Spring Church of Christ, the location of it, the mailing address, that I'm director of the annual Spring Church of Christ Continuing for the Faith Lectures, editor of Continuing for the Faith, and director of the Truth Bible Institute, and I give then the uh, websites for that. Well, a whole lot of those folks on that second list, I don't know who they are, and as I said, what I sent out was saying, is this, uh, does anybody know about whether this thing is true or not? I did that on two things. Well, when I got home on Wednesday night, here came, uh, as I opened up to check my email, and remember that email I sent out had nothing to do with anything Bible or religious. But now remember what's at the bottom of my email, and that pretty well identifies me. (laughs) So here's what I had on on email. Sir, Luke chapter 18, verses 13 and 14, 
was a pretty short and powerful sinner's prayer that Jesus approved of saying that the publican went home saved. Now that person knows something about what faithful churches of Christ teach from the Bible about how a person is saved and when a person is saved and the steps in God's plan of salvation. You'll hear much about this, although most already know it, that most people who claim Christ as Savior will simply say, the moment I acknowledge in my mind that He is the Son of God and Savior, then I'm saved. And certainly you do not have to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ in order to receive the remission of sins. Well, this fellow knows that. What else he knows, I don't know. But my sermon consists of just letting you know what... Uh, what opportunities avail themselves coming, number one, from places we never thought it would come. And we ought to be prepared then to do it. I'm glad he said what he said. And so I responded in this way. While Jesus was on earth, he forgave sins as he chose to do so. However, we now have Jesus ruling from heaven over all things and manifesting his saving power through the words of his last will and testament. And I cited then Acts chapter 2 and Peter's statement in that recorded sermon on the day the church was begun by the Lord, verses 29 through 42, where he declares him to be the Son of God and proves it from the Old Testament and declared that it was through Him that salvation now is offered to all mankind. And all I can say now is go back and read Acts chapter 2 and read that first recorded gospel sermon. I also cited Hebrews 9 and verse 17 that makes it clear that the testament is a force after men are dead and that the whole point of the inspired writer of Hebrews is to show why we're no longer under the law of Moses but we're under the authority of Jesus Christ in his words or by his words of his last will and testament, which is the New Testament of the Bible. I went ahead to say, while you are alive on earth, you can dispense uh, whatever you have in any way you choose. But people write their wills so that after their death, their last will and testament becomes the only authority whereby their will is known. The same last will and testament of Jesus Christ that teaches one must believe in Christ in order to be saved from sin also teaches that the believer in Christ must repent of his sins, confess his faith in Christ that he is the Son of God, and be immersed in water by the authority of Christ in order to be saved from one's sins. I then cited John 8, 24, where Jesus said to the Jews, Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. I then went to Matthew's account of the Great Commission and pointed out from Matthew 28 through uh, verse 18 through 20 that Jesus said, All power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I then went to Mark's account and pointed out the second part of the Great Commission as Mark gives it in verse 16 of Mark 16, where Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I then went to Acts 17 and 30, where Paul is preaching on Mars Hill in Athens, and point out that he said that at the, at the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. I then went back to Acts 2.38, where Peter took those who were hearing him, that he cried out, having been pricked in their heart by the truth, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 37, he answered them as believers, saying, Repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I then went to Acts chapter 10 and verse 47. These are citations in the email. And pointed out that at the household of Cornelius that it's obvious from the text that he had believed. And uh, Peter made it very clear. Can any man forbid water that they should be baptized? In verse 47 it says he commanded them to be baptized. Then in Acts 22, in verse uh, 
uh, I'd say 47 and 48 actually of, of uh, Acts 10. And then in chapter 22, 16, in Paul's second account of his conversion, he says to um, or Ananias, the preacher whom the Lord chose to go to Saul and tell him what he needed to know and what he needed to do to become a Christian, he tells the believing, repentant, confessing Saul and now. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I then cited Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, that talks about being buried with our Lord in baptism. Uh, then Galatians 3, verses 26 and 27, which teaches we're saved by faith, when that faith, of course, leads us to be baptized into Jesus Christ. And then I cited Peter as the last one at this point, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, where Peter writes to Christians reminding them at what point their sins were remitted, at what point they became Christians, and he made it clear the like figure wherein even baptism doth also now save us. Then I wrote, we must take all, and I capitalized all, we must take all that the Bible teaches on any topic and not just part of it before we determine what the will of the Lord is on a matter. So God's great plan of salvation whereby he favors mankind in offering him forgiveness of sins, something mankind does not deserve and he cannot merit, is found only in the gospel of Christ. And then I cited Romans 1.16 where Paul said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, it's interesting to note, and I didn't say this here because I didn't want to make it any longer than I had to and still cover what he was concerned about and, frankly, confused over. I could have uh, pointed out that it says there the gospel saves the believer. Read it. The gospel is the power of God to save what person? The unbeliever or the believer? Well, listen to Paul. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Word of God. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth. So it's obvious once you're brought to belief in Christ, there's something else the gospel has to say to you about exactly when God will remit your sins. So the gospel is the power of God to save the believer. Thus a believer is not saved in and of himself alone by the very act of acknowledging the historical fact that Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So, one must hear the word of Christ, Luke 8 and verse 11. The word of God there is said to be the seed of the kingdom. Well, if you want the kingdom, you have to plant the seed of the kingdom. And here, Jesus himself said, as Luke records it in Luke 8 11, that the word's the seed of the kingdom. I then went ahead and pointed out that it is that word whereby uh, belief is formed in a person. I again cited Romans 10, 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I referred him again to John 8, 24, where Jesus himself said, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. I then referred him to Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 6, where the inspired writer said, now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Then in verse 6, but without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I then pointed out that the third step in God's great plan of salvation is that one must repent of one's sins. Remember Acts 2.38 said to those who believers, who were believers and had been brought to belief by understanding the gospel, that Peter took them as believers and told them the rest of the conditions of salvation by saying, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. I cited again Acts 17.30, where Paul said, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And then I pointed out step number four, that we're to confess our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. With the heart man believeth unto salvation, uh, and uh, with the mouth one confesses to unto salvation. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. And 5, one must be immersed in water by the authority of Jesus Christ into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of one's sins. Then number 6, 
And I didn't cite verses there because I already cited them. Then number six, the Lord adds the person saved from his sins to his church. Acts 2 and verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized and there were added unto them about 3,000 on that day. In Acts 2, 47 also. More than the previous plan of salvation, I wrote to him. More than the previous plan of salvation, God does not demand of anyone in order to become a Christian. Less than compliance with each step in this plan of salvation, and one cannot be saved. Thereby, one becomes a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. A member of the church Jesus built and purchased with his own blood. Matthew 16, 18, where he said, I will build my church. And Acts 20 and 28, where it's declared plainly that he purchased the church with his blood. And I end that sentence by saying, not a member of any man-made denomination. Then I went ahead to write, we must learn to follow 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And have what Jesus said is necessary concerning honesty. Luke 8 verse 15. If we are to benefit as God intended from the study of his word, we must have the authority of Christ for all we believe in practice. Colossians 3 and verse 17. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And then I conclude that paragraph with, this is the way that is right and cannot be wrong. I close in this paragraph by saying, it is my prayer that this very brief study on what one must, I capitalized must and bolded it, believe and do in order to be saved from one's sins and become a New Testament Christian will help you in your study of God's Word. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to write these words to you by writing your email to me. All of us must keep in mind what Jesus taught in John 12, 48, which reads, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Then I say, as we search the scriptures, I wish you the best in your search for the truth concerning salvation. And I ended with these scriptures. John 8, 31 and 32 where Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I then cited in Jesus' prayer in John 17, 17, where Jesus prayed, Father, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. I then pointed out Paul's writing where he's talking about Christians putting on the whole armor of God where Paul said that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And I ended with this passage, Hebrews 4, 12. Now the word of God is quick and powerful, alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the joints and uh, marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So... We need to understand uh, that's as brief as you can get it. Now, that preaches longer than it reads. It's about four paragraphs. It's not even a page. And when you're writing something, you'd like to think that people can go back and reread, that they can take a dictionary and that they will understand what they read. They can read the citations. If they misunderstand it and they're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, they'll go back and reread it that they'll be honest and compare and contrast what they already believe with these things right here. Okay, you keep that in mind, what all I wrote. So I ended up getting this back, and the whole thing's capitalized. Thank you so very much for your informative response. I have followed each of the steps to become a Christian and follower of Christ. I agree 100% with your word on that, that is the Word of God. Now another question, and a very, very important one at that. If I am currently attending and am a member of a Baptist church, am I considered lost? What did I write? Does that tell you, brethren, the state of the world today? And not only that, when it comes to issues in the church and other matters, some of our own brethren. Now, that was answered fully and completely, even as I did write it, uh, in that uh, letter I'd already written. Now, why would he ask that question? Well, I try to be patient. He said, listen, uh, again, I'm considered lost and condemned to eternal destruction. That's a question. 
I do believe on Jesus Christ is risen from the grave and as my Savior. I have been baptized in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Am I not on my way to heaven? Thank you. He gives his name. I wrote him back. And I greeted him and said, thank you for your email. Before I answer your question, please tell me if you considered yourself saved from your sins before, and I bolded before, you were baptized. I look forward to your reply. Then I received this. Yes, well, would we like to stop there? Yes, however, I could not disobey the Lord and refuse to be baptized. I read in Romans that Paul said that with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And with the heart, the very seed of our emotions, I should believe unto righteousness. Had I not heard the gospel preached, I could have never been, quote, saved, unquote. My faith was ignited by the word preached at that particular moment, and I believe Christ as the Lord, as Lord and Savior. I then was baptized as soon as possible within days. Of course, I know that faith, baptism, and salvation is the whole experience in one package, so to speak. Do you not explain salvation to your hearers at church meetings? And do they respond to your preaching of the word? Do they not then come to be baptized? Would anybody voluntarily be baptized without knowing why they are being baptized in the first place? Of course, faith leads us to salvation slash baptism by the hearing of the word, the gospel. I know this is a long answer to a simple question, but that's the answer that I give. Thank you. And he signs it. Well, I uh, wrote this just yesterday. In answer to my question asking you if you were saved from your sins before you were baptized, you said yes. Thus, you do not believe that you were baptized to obtain the remission of your sins. Therefore, my answer to your question of whether you are a Christian or not is that you are not a Christian. You ask me if I, quote, explain salvation to my hearers at church meetings, unquote. Indeed, I do. But since the New Testament of Christ plainly teaches that believers in Christ who have repented of their sins and confessed their faith in Christ are the only person scripturally qualified to be baptized into Christ, in order to obtain the remission of sins, now again, uh, cite Acts 2.38, chapter 22.16, and Galatians 3.27, along with 1 Peter 3.21, then I do not teach them they are saved before and without being baptized uh, to that end. You also ask, would anybody voluntarily be baptized without knowing why they're being baptized in the first place? I call his name and I say I'm not in a position to know the minds of all those people who have been, are, or will be baptized and no one else is either. But I do know that those people who think they're saved from their sins before they've been baptized to obtain the forgiveness or remission of their sins continue in their sins and thus remain in need of salvation. Acts 22:16. I trust you'll continue to study your Bible and rightly divide the word of truth that you may come to a saving knowledge of Christ. And I again cite 2 Timothy 2.15 and John 8.31 and 32. Whether he writes back or not, I don't know, but I said I look forward to your next email and wish him the best in all things. The reason I chose this is because it's so introductory in so many ways the state of the mind of people today who know very little Bible and what they know, it's all mixed up. But what makes me more sad than ever is that what if he had written this to some of our own preachers in certain churches today and said, well, the sinner's prayer, you know, uh, I'm lost, Christ save me. And they, I know what they would have written back to him. Well, that's just fine. Brethren, we cannot compromise the totality of the truth of God's word on anything. And it's certainly not on the plan of salvation. Listen, there's either one uh, singular plan of salvation or there's not. A person is either baptized for unto in order to the remission of sins, or he is not. Now, I know that Baptists baptize and immerse in water, but I know they baptize on the basis of one already being saved the moment he believed. So there's no way in the world you can say, well, I was baptized. Well, why were you baptized? 
That's the question to ask. I've even had people, and I think others have too, in fact, I know they have, who, knowing they were immersed in water to obey God, but they were not baptized in water in order to the end, which is remission or forgiveness of sins. And yet when they learn the truth, as I've tried to present it here this morning and in the letters, because they know they were immersed in water, they automatically assume they were baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins. I know one lady who was a member of the Baptist Church in the process of studying with her over a period of time was denying up one side and down the other that she had been baptized because she had been saved in her mind and she had been taught Baptist doctrine at the point of her belief. We simply sent her to a Baptist preacher and said, you ask him if the Baptist church, according to Baptist doctrine, immerses people in water in order for them to be saved from their sins. And, of course, the Baptist preacher, not knowing who she was or her background and why she wrote, let her know in uncertain terms that no, we don't baptize people in order for them to be saved from their sins. They're saved the moment they believe. And then we baptize them in imitation of Christ. Brethren, we have great opportunities today, but the thing that bothers me more than ever is some of our own brethren would say, oh, you're a fine person. You sincerely did what you thought was best at the time, and after all, you were baptized to obey God anyway. He says that. But that's not enough, beloved. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know why you're doing it. That is, the reason you're doing it. Imagine you're singing this morning in this act of worship. Somebody says, why are you as a Christian singing? I don't know. It's what we've always done. Well, I don't doubt there's some brethren have to say that. They answered honestly. Well, why are you taking the Lord's Supper? I don't know. I just was a member of a family that grew up in the Church of Christ, and that's what we all have done. And nowadays they say, that's our tradition. And so we do it because we like to do it. Rather than that's what human denominations have always done and tried to get it over to us that, well, we all believe in Christ as Savior. So you go to your church, I'll go to mine, we'll all get to heaven together. I had a fellow up one time years ago. We were knocking doors one place. Come to the door, and we told him we was. He said, well, uh, it doesn't make you any difference. We're all headed to the same place. And I said, yeah, we are. The judgment bar of God. We're all headed to that place. But now what are we going to give account of there on the light of what standard? What standard will judge you on the last great day? Do you even know what will be the absolute objective standard of judgment? Now, you know to get a foot ruler if you're going to measure something. You know what a speed limit is. You know there's weights and measures. But what's going to be the standard of judgment the day you all by yourself stand before Jesus Christ to give an account of your life in the flesh? Well, it's going to be his last will and testament. That's why I put in there John 12, 48. Jesus himself said, He that rejecteth me... And receiveth not my words, hath one that judges him, the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. There's a standard of judgment. Now life's a schoolroom. God is our teacher. And in the Bible is a textbook. And life is set up to get you ready for eternity when you will live it in the light of the right of the divided word. Thus, if you're not learning now the truth of the gospel concerning salvation and all things pertaining thereto, you're going to, I'm sorry to say, get a great big red F for all eternity when you stand before him because you're going to flunk the judgment. Now, you may flunk a lot of things. You do not want to flunk the judgment because that's when the Lord looks down upon you and says, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity, in the everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, ye that work iniquity. Iniquity is sin. Iniquity is contrary to God's will for the way people are to believe and live. Now, that means there's a standard. Sometimes people in trying to oppose God... We'll talk about the matter of good and evil. Now, when you talk about good from the philosopher's standpoint or what the Bible says, you're talking about a matter of oughtness, that it is a moral or spiritual act. It is an imperative. It must be done a certain way, and God's the only one that can 
comment on that. It's His will that directs us. But do you realize if there is an evil, that that within itself proves the existence of God? Somebody had to set the divine standard of moral and spiritual conduct. Somebody does. And if God doesn't do it, who does? Who has the authority to do that if it's not God? Okay, if you violate God's will, what is that? It's evil. So evil exists because God exists because God gave us His will for life. And therefore, when we transgress it, we work evil. So there couldn't be an evil if there wasn't a standard, and there wouldn't be a standard if there wasn't a God. Now the atheists have a fit over that, and they figure out, try to figure out all sorts of approaches to say, well, you can have an absolute objective standard, but without God. It can't be done. Rather interesting than try to do it. So here's the truth. It's static. It doesn't change. The Lord's will for me to be saved is the same will for anybody else who's accountable to God to be saved. It doesn't change because you're old, male or female, young, married, not married, whatever, rich, poor, God's no respect for persons, but in every nation, he that worketh righteousness is accepted of him. Well, how does one work righteousness? Well, you better know the gospel plan of salvation, seeing that the gospel is the place where God's located his power to save. Does God save us? Yes. Does he have the power to save us? Yes. Then the next question is, where does he locate that power? He locates it in the gospel. That's why Jesus said the gospel must be preached to every creature. Because that's the way the power of God reaches people to save them. And they can't be saved without the power of God to save them. Well, I wanted you to hear that because if you're going to hear a lot about it, I imagine, this kind of thing when we have this particular study upcoming and when you get the book, if so you do. I will keep you posted on what happens here. I uh, hope to keep it on the high plane that it's been. We'll just have to see what happens. Brethren... The truth you can know and know that you know it. Let me say that again. The truth I'm talking about regarding salvation. You can know and know that you know it. You can know the Lord's church and how it sets apart from all man-made churches and every other religion that's not from God. You ought to want to know that. It's the most important thing for you to know. There are a lot of things in the world you may never know. And you'll get through life all right. But you need to know the way of salvation and what all is involved in God's way of salvation presented to man in the gospel system. And it's time that the Lord's church rise up and take its place. Years ago, what I preached would have been common in every pulpit in the land. It would have been tolerated otherwise. Nowadays, because certain people have decided to leave the pattern of truth that is the New Testament, they're liable to tell you anything. Well, let me tell you something. Regardless of what they do or they don't do as churches and elders and whatever, you have a personal, individual responsibility to take this divine volume that holds the truth, that declares the truth, that supports the truth concerning salvation. And you need to do what it says whether anybody else does or not. And I say in closing, that is the way that's right and can't be wrong. And when you stand before your Lord in judgment, you'll be fully vindicated for all eternity when he says, well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joy of the Lord. And all these trials and tribulations and bearing our cross daily will fade into insignificance as there looms before us a bright and glorious eternity which our mind cannot begin to picture as we walk the streets of gold and the glorified immortals long gone who proved their love of God and faith in God and his system of salvation as they lived on this earth. So let us line up and march according to the gospel orders that we too will be considered good soldiers of the cross when we stand before the chief captain of our salvation on the great day of judgment. As a child of God, are you faithful? Do you understand what all that means? Are you living day by day as the New Testament says? Now we've determined what to do from the Bible to become a Christian. Now we're talking about are you faithful if you've done that? Are you continuing faithful? If not, repent of those sins. Come and confess them. We'll pray with you and for you. And God stands ready to forgive. 
We studied, as I said, what to do to become a Christian. So if you need to obey the gospel to become a Christian, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.